All right, Big Naz, how's it going, man? Ah, I'm good, man. I'm good. Right, we got a Detroit's finest. Yes. Eminem's yes. ex-bodyguard. Yes. Yes, the notorious ex-bodyguard. Um, yeah. A lot of the fans love me. A lot of them hated me. <laughs> you know, but it comes with it when, when you write a tell-all book. Right, you know, right. Based on the world's greatest rapper of all times. Let's be real. The boy dope, man. Well, let's start from the beginning. How did you guys meet? I got a call from my buddy, uh, Wolf, and um, he knew that he knew that um, a mutual party, and they were looking for a bodyguard to do his personal security, and they called me, and I told him, I said, hey, man, I'm really kind of done with that. I got, a, I got a nine to five now, and I really don't want to be involved with no rappers no more. At that point, I was 28. I had been doing it for six years you know, already, and uh, I turned him down, so Paul Rosenberg called me. He said, hey, look, man, I heard you're the best in the business. Uh, we want you to do this rave party um, for Eminem. You heard of Eminem? I said, yeah, I just bought a CD yesterday. I said, I said he's, he's a dope artist. He said, man, what do you think about it? I called him back. I said, okay, man, I'll do it, but I need two people on it. And um, we negotiated a fee. I went on and did it. They liked the way I work, and the rest is history, man. Okay. At what point in uh, Eminem's career was this? This was actually, I went on tour with him during the first album. His album had just went platinum. Oh, okay. The week that I started working with him, he had, he had just went platinum. So you started off going on tour with him? I started off doing a rave party in Detroit, on the east oh, side of okay. Detroit, in this, uh, this big-ass empty warehouse, and it's all these suburban kids coming from everywhere, from Detroit, Ohio. I mean, man, this place was packed. And uh, they had pyrotechnics, all that kind of shit, man. And uh, it was a rave party. And I remember even being a couple of dentists coming through with the uh, nitrous oxide so people can do whippets. So it was uh, a lot of drugs. In the beginning, I think that it was it was more so he really didn't believe it or not, man. This, a lot of people don't know this. M didn't do a lot of drugs in the beginning. Uh. The song, that song that he has, I can't remember the name of the song, where, he's, where he sings drugs really, these drugs really got a hold of me. Right. And he keeps refraining that course. It was pretty much drug free at that time. And it's almost like that song put the negative energy out there for him to really end up being hooked on drugs. Because he wasn't on drugs in the beginning. Matter of fact, Kim used to call me. Hey, Naz, can you make sure that Marshall doesn't do any drugs. Um, and that was, my, that was part of my job, man, to protect him and to protect him from drug use, so. Oh, okay. Yeah. At, at what point did the drugs start getting heavy? Baltimore. Oh, okay. I seen the, God. I, I can't, I, I, I'm angry at myself because in my mind, I could have stopped it. Mm. Um, he had a road manager, not a road manager, I'm sorry, uh, assistant manager at, his, at that time who would constantly push drugs. Push drugs as in to say, hey man, look, take this, this will give you energy. Hey man, take this, this will do this, this will give you up. And I, me and that guy would fall out all the time and say, hey man, don't do that to him, man. I said, the guy's not on, the, he's not on any drugs. He don't need it. He's already a high level energetic person anyway. The guy ate healthy, drank a lot of water. He was going through this whole vegan thing. He was losing weight. And I seen it happen in Baltimore where this particular person went, had this knapsack backpack and he pulled proof and Eminem into the bathroom. And I was telling him, hey man, don't give him that. Don't give him that. I said, hey man, don't take that, man. Don't take none. So they're inside the bathroom M and Proof got their back toward me. And the guy name is DT. They don't need me trying to avoid his name. DT facing toward me, and he's slowly closing the door. As he's closing the door, Eminem disappears, and you can see half of the face of DT, and he got this sinister look on his face. I'm like, man, don't have them get on that shit. So as I go to try to push the door, but he closed and locked the door. And to me, I've always said that's when the drug habit started in Baltimore. 
And when I say drugs, at that time when I was working with him, it was the recreational stuff. Weed, shrooms, ecstasy, whippets, none of the hardcore shit while I was working with him. But at one point, somebody was going out in every city and, and getting them drugs. Here's the thing, man. Really, you didn't have to go out. A lot of the drugs are thrown on stage. People were throwing drugs hey, on man, stage. Let me let me let me be real, be real with you, man. It ain't just it wasn't just with Eminem. Any rock, any rocker, any hip hop artist, and it depends on it depends on your demographic. So if you're a rapper, they're throwing fifty dollar bags, ten dollar bags of weed on the oh, stage. Okay. If you if you're a rocker, they're throwing acid. They're throwing they're throwing coke. They're throwing heroin. This has been going on for decades, man. You know, we talk, we're talking about 50, 60, 70 years, as long as rock has been alive with the music industry. Um, because the fans want to personalize the concert of being able to say, hey man, I gave I gave M some acid or I gave I gave such and such a fifty dollar bag. And they would do these drugs that people would throw on stage? Um not all of them. <laughs> you can't technically do all of right, them. Right, right. It would be like a pick and choose. It would be like Halloween, man. You, you sift through the shit. Wow. Like, ah, you know, we won't take that one. I don't know what that is. Okay, we know what weed is. You know, it, 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 there was a point where I always had to tell these guys, we don't know what these people are throwing on stage, so don't keep, don't, don't take that shit. So a lot of stuff, the weed was probably the safest drug that would be taken. Um, was smoked. The right. other shit, man, I, I would really pretty much shut that down. So if anything was done outside of the marijuana, that was usually something that was selected or grocery shopped themselves. Believe it or not, man, this is, this is gonna sound like an oxymoron. It was such a health nut. I mean, deli trays, one of the things that was on his rider was deli trays. Um, water, lemon, turkey, chicken. Really, we kind of came in as a thing. Ah, you know what? I don't have no I'm just gonna do it. I really don't want to do it, but I'm just gonna do it. And it was nobody really pushed him to do it. He just he's like, "Fuck it, I'm gonna do it." I think it, it, I think he started taking some of the recreational drugs as a as a joke. Because it wasn't something that he had to, you know, that he had to do. Because he was such a health nut, man. A lot of people don't know that. So there would be times um, <laughs> he takes some stuff before stage and uh, before he goes on. And I, I can remember one time we were in Boston. This is a this is a story that never made the book. So I might as well let this out now because I'm not I'm not revising or adding any other stories to the book. So you get an exclusive right here. We were in Boston. And we did this, this show, and the stage had to be at least 12 feet from the ground. So you had the stage, and then you had the barricades, and then you had the crowd. M had drank, his drink was uh, Bacardi White. And was it Bacardi White? I think it was Bacardi White. He had Bacardi White, and he liked Heineken's. So you, you drink a little bit of Heineken. You know, everybody drink backstage. You know, before you go on, it's like it's like the pep rally, man. It's like football team. You getting hyped up before you go out there to perform. You know, right. everybody take a little sip or something. This particular day, he did too much. I think he um, he took an X and he took a, he took a cap of a shroom. So he's into the show is off the chain, man. He's getting into. He's getting into the second verse of Brain Damage, the song Brain Damage. He's walking across the stage. I'm far left. He's walking across the stage, and he's hyped. He's doing this thing, man, and he's getting ready to go into the second verse, and before he can put his foot down, the drugs kicked in. You've seen it. Everything just went in slow motion, and he couldn't. He couldn't remember the words. So Proof had to step up and finish the second verse. At that point, M was completely high. I don't know about you, but I've never seen anybody high kick in the moment that it kicks in. 
That was the first and only time I've ever seen that. And he ended up falling off the stage. He fell off the stage, hit the barricade. It's dark. So you don't know how far down it is. So when he falls off the stage, I jump down to get him. And I remember jumping down, and I'm 6'8". It's taking me forever. I'm like, shit, when does this thing end? So when I jumped down, I almost landed on him. So as I'm getting closer to the ground, I see him, so I had to straddle my legs. He had hit his ribs on the, on the barricade. So Proof pretty much ended up finishing the rest of the show. We got him back on stage so he can complete the contract. Uh, but Proof carried him throughout the show, I mean, you know, vocally. So Proof became the artist and M became the hype man. So whatever words he could remember at that time, that's what words he would do and then Proof carried the show. And then we ended up going to the hospital. We had to go to the emergency because he, he hurt himself pretty bad, man. So EMS came, uh, loaded him up, went to the hospital. And so you got this team of docs that are doing x-rays and everything. And come to find out, he just had bruised ribs, no cracked ribs. Then you got all these doctors that's coming from all over, all over the facility that's taking like a group picture. And they, yeah, yeah, it was crazy, man. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember M saying after everybody left, he said, hey, uh, before I leave, uh, can somebody uh, give me a prescription for Vicodin? So that that was we, we all bust out and we laughed, man. So that was that was one of those stories. Did he man. get his prescription? Nah, man, they didn't give it to him. <laughs> they didn't give it to him. <laughs> oh, man. At one point, uh, you said he did fourteen drugs in yeah. one day. Yeah, yeah. Can you take yeah. me through that day? Oh man, Dude, you talking about twenty years ago? I would literally have to go back and read the book. Read my own book. Um, well, you didn't, in the book, you didn't really, you just said it. I, re, I remember the day, I remember, we were, we were out here in Cali. Oh, okay. We were in Cali. Um, he was recording, he was recording the second album, the Marshall Mathers LP. And um, I remember him having trouble sleeping. So a lot of it was, uh, was sleeping pills, uh, so he could go to sleep, because he had problems sleeping. And then... Uh, there was some ecstasy, there was some shrooms, um, some weed. Oh man, it was just. I and mean, then what did the day, what did he start off with during the day in oh, the morning? Man. Usually, when he started off in the day, what he would call uh, helicopters. Helicopters, that's what he called it, were, uh, was ecstasy. Oh, okay. So he would take a half pill. Like I said, he was a diet, he was, he was a person that he was on a diet, so he never took a whole pill. He always took. Maybe a quarter or a, or a fraction of a helicopter. So he would feed off the little like. Well, some people just pop a whole pill. He would just break little like little crumbs off, you know, periodically throughout the day. So throughout the whole day, he might take a whole pill, um, and then he eventually graduated to doing a half a pill. You know. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. That was that's how he would start his day. Were you were you worried that day like he was gonna overdose or I anything? Was, uh, yeah, I was. I was, man, because I, I literally would sit there and watch him sleep. I would have to sit there and watch him sleep to make sure he didn't go into cardiac arrest or he stopped breathing. Because it was like... When oh, you so you had to watch... Because I, I think you said he, he was even scared to go to sleep. He was, scared to, he was scared to go to sleep because he took so many different drugs. And um, we, we all were like on high alert. Like, we got to watch this guy, man, because we don't know what he's going to do. So you watched him the whole night, or we, how much we of had the to, night? man. We had to. Look, the thing oh, a lot of people don't understand: wherever M stayed in the hotel, there was always an adjoining a, a door, and the rule was to leave the door unlocked. So in the event that something happens periodically throughout the night, I go in and check on him, make sure you know he was okay, or if there was females over there. Hey, look, you gotta go, sweetie. It's time for you to go. Well, he said I can stay. No, you have to go. He's sleep. You gotta go. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, man. You, you'd be amazed at some of the stuff that I had to do, man. Wow. My job went above and beyond being a bodyguard. The, the book talks about some male groupies. Mm. <laughs> Pittsburgh. Is that the one? The other word Pittsburgh. The, Pittsburgh. The guy. Can you, can you take me through the, the whole... The whole uh, the, the, okay, so the this thing? is what happened. We, we, did a, we did a show in Pittsburgh after we come off of the House of Blues tour... Some of the dates, you know, were consisted of House of Blues. So we did House of Blues. We did 
We did House of, we did Chicago House of Blues, then we did Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh was the second stop. So we get into we get into Pittsburgh. There's this crazy fan, male crazy fan, who has uh, he has a bald head. First we thought he was a skinhead, but he wasn't. He had a bald head. And he had a mushroom tattooed on his head and it said Eminem. How big was the mushroom? Oh, it was a big ass mushroom. Wow. It, it was a big mushroom. It was, how, it was, how big was the Eminem? It, it was underneath. It was underneath the mushroom. Oh, okay. It was big enough. I was like, first of all, it's four, like right here where right everybody here, can man. see it? Right above the hairline. Was, yes. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So Eminem's doing the show, and I, I, I vaguely remember Eminem doing the show, and he looked, he looked at me like, look, this dude got a mushroom tattooed on his head with my name underneath. And I think that's when he started to realize that fans are crazy. So uh, that night, one of my jobs was at the end of the show, we would always hold like an after party in the green room. So M was like, yo, get that guy, man. Get that guy with the mushroom tatted on his head, man. That dude's fucking wild, man. I said, you sure? He said, yeah, man, get that dude, man. So I rounded him up, some young ladies, um, had him backstage. But the thing is, unfortunately, well, fortunately, like all rockers and rappers do, you got to be the hottest chick to get backstage. You got to be the hottest chick. It's, it's whatever that artist preference is. So a lot of times they would flash tits. They flash the tits. And they look good. Come backstage. Check ID, of course. Get backstage. So we're backstage. We got probably about 30 people in the green room, man. About 30 people in the green room. We, we partying. We having a good time, man. We having a good time. The dude with the shroom tattoo comes up to me and say, Hey, man. I want a snake bite Eminem. I said, what? <laughs> he said, I want a snake bite Eminem. And I was like, fuck is he talking about? So I, I tell him, I say, hey man, come here, man. Because, you know, I'm, I'm a brother, man. I'm a black guy, man. I didn't know if it was white terminology or not. I don't know what that means, man. I didn't know if it was like a new drink or what. I don't know. So I said, Em, come here, man. I said, um, this dude right here with the tattoo, man, you know, he won't talk to you. He said, yeah, man, tell him to come over. So the guy leans in with the tattoo and he's whispering in Em's ear. He said, hey, dude, I want to snake bite you. So, so, so it says, it says, fuck is that? He said, dude, I want to suck your dick. He said, get this motherfucker out of here. <laughs> he said, get this motherfucker out of here right now, man. So as he says that, I said, why? He said, the motherfucker trying to suck my dick. So, so the guy was like, wait a minute, man. So I picked him up. I picked the guy up in mid-sentence, man. And I'm carrying him out the door. I got him, I got him over my head, man. Stepping through the crowd. Throw him out. So then I told all the dudes, he said, all you fucking dudes in here, every, all you, every fucking guy in here, get the fuck out. So, kick, oh shit, kicked out all the guys. Kicked out all the guys. And that night began the no sausage party, no sausage rule. After that, no dudes were allowed backstage. Mm. <laughs> yep. Well, What'd you guys? What'd you guys think when, like, afterwards? What'd you guys? Oh, we laughed, man. We laughed our ass off, man. I mean, you know, that was that was I mean, that was different. I've only heard that terminology one time ever in my life, man. Snake bite somebody? I never heard of that myself. Uh, yeah, apparently in Pittsburgh they snake bite people. Well, wow. these dudes do. I mean, shit. Was that the only time you seen uh, guys hit on him? Oh no, 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 man! Um, when we went to uh, where were we at? We were in the UK. We were <laughs> we were in the UK, and there was a situation where some promoters, some promoters, this this party did a party, and um, all these people were there, and it was guys. It was a bunch of chicks there. But it was guys there, you know, a lot of European guys. And they say, you know, guys are asking dudes like questions and shit. You know, you think that they're being fans. A guy approached me. He said, he said hey, man, um, what are you doing after this? I said, what do you mean what I'm doing after this? I said, I'm doing security. He said, man, I was wondering if we can hang out. I said, hey, man, uh, you barking up the wrong tree there, buddy. 
He said, well, we thought that, you know, I, I can bring my guys and, we, and your guys, man, and we, we all can get together and have a little fun, man, you know, do some sexual things. I said, oh, shit. I said, hey, party over with. I said, we out of here right now. So when I did this, that means we're walking. This right here, you could be in the midst of a great conversation trying to get a piece of ass anything. And you can see me on the other side of the club because I'm always the tallest guy in the spot. When you see me doing this, that means somebody's going to get in a fight. Somebody's getting ready to get fucked. But who shouldn't be getting fucked is preferably a dude by a dude. And uh, that means we got to go. So that night we got there real quick, man. And a couple of fights almost happened in the process of getting out because dudes were trying to push up on us, man. Wasn't cool, man. I mean, to each his own, but leave mine alone. Right, that's that's just crazy. Yeah, man. it's crazy, man. I mean, you know, you, you have a right to do whatever you want to do with your life, man, but don't infringe on my ass, man. I mean, shit. Leave that shit over there. Leave it with you. You know, leave it with you. That's well, not what I do. What would Eminem think when these when these dudes would hit on him? He would think that just as we would, it was like, like, wow, are, are we doing something? Are we doing something that, that's egging these people on? Or, or is it an open invite? But it's not that. It's just a, people going to shoot their shot. Oh, yeah. People going to shoot their shot, man. And, and that being said, you have a lot of people in the industry that walk both sides of life. So I guess they were shooting their shot to see who's who. People going to shoot their shot, man. Yeah. Male, female. Listen, man. I've seen so much stuff on the road. The craziest thing that I've ever seen on the road was a mother, mother, daughter wanted to tag team M mm. while we watched. And the daughter was pregnant, like five months pregnant. So I don't know if that's a threesome or a three point, uh, three and a half, or I don't know what that is. It's creepy. Yeah. A mother and a daughter. A mother and how daughter they, how they and a soon-to-be grandchild. In this, in the grand, and then the mother's and the daughter's belly. How big was the belly? Oh shit, she was about four five months. Wow. Uh, how did they approach you guys? Did they approach you? No, the mother approached us first on the freeway. We were we were going, I think we were on our way to Boston or Baltimore when Woodstock happened, and they had the second Woodstock in in '99, and the okay. freeway was backed up. And we were at a standstill on the freeway. All the cars were parked on the freeway. So we're in a tour bus. So it's, a, it's this mom in her car, this hot mom in her car next to us. She tells the bus driver, hey, I want to come with you guys' tour bus. So the bus driver says, shit, come on. So she gets out the car. She gets out her car on the freeway, walks around, comes on the tour bus, showing off her tits, showing off her ass. She was hot. She was a MILF. She was a MILF. And... Um, she says, hey, can you, guys, can you guys give me some tickets to the concert tonight? I said, yeah, we'll get you a ticket. We'll put you on roll call. She said, well, how many, people, how many people can I get? He said, well, we'll give you a plus one. The plus one was her daughter. And she said, well, you know, my daughter's hot. You know, when you guys might want to make out with her, just that and the other, yada, yada, yada. She says, okay, if the mom got a nice ass, more than likely the daughter might have a nice ass. So they show up, and the daughter's pregnant. Wow. She like water break pregnant. Like King had it pregnant. Wow. Yeah. What did Em have to say about that? We was like, dude, he was like, he said, man, you fucking shit. So the mother and the daughter starts making out. I can't make this shit up, man. We had a room full of people in the suite. The mother and the daughter starts making out on the bed. In front of everybody. In front of everybody. And the mother and daughter wanted M to join in. He was like, man, I'm not getting in that shit. Wow. Nobody got in. In fact, we ended up putting them out, man. Okay. <laughs> it was creepy, man. I'll tell you, you seen a lot of shit on the road, man. It's, oh, God. Yeah. It, it, oh, God, man. In Vegas, you guys had a show where a guy wore an ICP shirt. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, an insane clown posse shirt. Yeah, that wasn't very smart. That wasn't very smart. 
um, everybody, well, everybody don't know, because we're talking about this 20 years ago, so a lot of the kids that's listening to him now was, wasn't even born. Um, but what ended up happening was, at that time, Eminem and ICP had an extremely big beef. It was huge. M hated them. They hated M. I mean, it got to the point where it was a lot of people, ICP was sending henchmen after us to try to interrupt shows. But this kid had on this ICP t-shirt and he's heckling the crowd. M stops his show in the middle of his performance. This kid is sitting bottom left corner of the stage, up front. He's enjoying the show, but he's on an ICP t-shirt. So fucking disrespectful. What were you thinking when you seen the guy with the shirt? I said, this kid about to get his ass whooped, man. He's a white kid, man. He didn't know no better. He just forget, you know, I could just wear, you know, an ICP t-shirt. It's kind of like walking into U of M and pissing on the logo with a Michigan State jersey on. It was bad, man. So M stops the show. He points the guy out. He said, this motherfucker got on an ICP t-shirt? Y'all let this motherfucker in here with, in, in my show with an ICP t-shirt on? And the crowd turned and looks at this kid. They said, yo, get, this is what M says. Get this motherfucker out of here. Next thing I know, this kid gets snatched up by the crowd. They pick him up. The, the crowd picks the kid up. Next thing you know, he's being passed all the way to the back. No way. Oh, man. It was bad. It was bad. What'd man. they do to it? The crowd oh, they fucked him, him up. up. They fucked him up, man. But then, after the show, we go to the hotel. This same kid shows up at our hotel demanding to speak to Eminem. Mm. I had to go out to say, man, you don't get the fuck out of here, man. I said, how many times do you got to get your ass whooped? So I just want to talk to him. Dude's got blood all on his shirt. Nose is still bloody, man. Blood is dried out. Did I you said, guys think he wanted to fight? Or? No, you know what? I told him, said, get a kid a fucking Eminem shirt because he'll get his ass with you, man. Take the ICP shirt off and put an Eminem shirt on. Some of these fans, man, they were bananas, man. That kid's yeah. probably like a doctor now. Did yeah, yeah. Did Eminem want to fight him? No, he thought it was funny, man. Oh, okay. He thought it was funny, you know. Um, a lot of this stuff was very entertaining, you know, very entertaining because it's like, what lengths will some of these fans and these groupies will go to to get next to their favorite artists? I mean, everything from them interrupting your lunch or your dinner to want to be able to talk to you. Um, God, man. See, at that time, there was, it wasn't cell phones. It was the digital cameras. Oh, right, right. It was the digital cameras. So we'd be sitting at the airport eating, and people would just put the camera right in front of them. Go to take off run. I snatched the camera. I snatched the camera, take out the memory card, crush the phone, crush the camera, give it back to them. I said, now that, what I just did was just as rude as what you did while we're eating. You shove a camera in our face and just walk off, or try to walk off. But here's your camera back. It's in a million pieces, but you can take it back. Wow. So people would just come up to you guys and just, just not even, not even, hey, can I take a picture? Nah, not man. even, they don't ask no for consideration permission. or nothing. They don't ask for permission or forgiveness. They would just do it. Wow. They feel like if they, they bought your CD, they bought your poster, they bought your T-shirt, they bought a ticket to your concert. You owe them. And this is their moment. This is their one shot to say, hey, I got a picture with Eminem. And then they would, see, really, that's when the selfies started. People would queue up their camera, the digital cameras, and if we're sitting at Burger King or whatever, people would walk past, lean in, take the picture. Wow. And then try to run, but in the midst of trying to run, I was able, I've gotten so good where I would be able to time it, because they, as they run it, they always leave the camera out. So I snatched the camera. Uh. Pop. Pop the memory card out, crush, crush the camera, give it back to them. Uh, you guys were in San Francisco at a show one time, and uh, M was getting heckled? Yeah, it was a guy in the crowd, man. Oh, my God. Complete 
riot, man. It was a guy in the crowd that was heckling him. Fuck you, him. You ain't shit. You fucking whack. All that kind of stuff. And uh, M stops his show. He said, motherfucker, what you say to me? Now, he had already been drinking, you know. Oh, yeah. How, yeah. how much was he? Well, you know, you, you got to take... I want to say he was, he, was, he was inebriated, but it was one of those things where he was... He's hype. His adrenaline is high. He's in, the, he's in the highest point of his show. And you get somebody heckling him, talking shit. And the guy like throwing him, fuck you, motherfucker, this, that, and the other. M stops the show. He tells DJ Head, man, stop the fucking record. He said, I'm going to address this motherfucker right here. The guy was front and center. He said, man, fuck you, man. Get the fuck out of here. The guy said, man, fuck you. Next thing I know, M jumps off the stage with a flying right hook. They hit the guy. Hit the wrong fucking dude. Oh, no. So I jump in. Proof jump in. The DJ jumped in. The sound man jumped in. The Interscope street team jumped in. Uh, all the acts that was the opening acts jump in. Now, it's like 3,500 people, man, in this place. And we're, we're fighting everybody. It's about maybe 30 of us. That's not even, what is that, 1%? Of the crowd, dude. We when I jump in to get M, what were you, what were you thinking when the dude was heckling M? It was like every other night. Oh, uh, okay. It's, we get this shit all the time. So, it's, so Eminem kind of caught you off guard when he jumped off the. No, uh, no like he's all, he was always jumping in the crowd every night. He jumped in the crowd every night, every night. Crowd surf. Sometimes we get down there and get in the mosh pit. Uh, but when he jumped in, it it shocked me that he jumped in to fight. I had never seen that before. Mm. So when he jumped in the fight, that that changed everything, man. Because he's in the air like a damn superhero to hit the guy, but he hit the wrong dude. So now he jumps in, he hits he hits the wrong guy. Now he's down there fighting. He's on the bottom of a shit kicking pile. I jump in, I go to get him. I get a guy hit me in the back of my ear. So now everybody's rushing to the front. I was like, fuck him. This guy just hit me, man. <laughs> so the guy that hit me, I hit him. I cold cock his ass. I hit him so hard, knocked him out. The crowd had him wavering back and forth. So the guy, when I knocked him out, he didn't get a chance to fall. So he was wavering back and forth like a dead fish in the water, man. So then Proof jumps in. He was like, hey, we got to get him. Like, oh, shit, yeah. You know, that, that was the whole purpose of jumping in anyway. So we're pulling these guys off the M. It's about four guys. We're pulling them off. We're pulling them off. The last guy that's on them, hitting M, hitting M. So Proof, Proof goes in. He's kicking the guy, kicking the guy. It's a big dude, man, he's kicking the guy. M on the bottom, he's giving the guy some real shot. Uh, Proof, is, Proof is hitting this guy so hard, man. It sound like somebody banging on bongos, man. So now... I get my shots in too. I ain't gonna lie. Boom, boom. In fact, one of the guys we ended up we ended up breaking the guy's ribs. We ended up breaking the guy's ribs. So, grab the last guy off of him, through him. Now, mind you, while we're doing this, we're still getting hit, punched, kicked, but now we gotta focus on M. So people are getting free shots at us because we're trying to focus on M. So I take M. I throw him back on stage. I take proof. I throw him back on stage, and there was a point where me, Young Z, and a couple of the guys from the Outsiders, we're back to back, knocking motherfuckers out, man. We just, we throwing haymakers, man, dropping people. You run up, you get dropped. You get dropped. You get dropped. So it was at a point, man, it was just people just laid out. The crowd was an absolutely pandemonium, man. So now I help those guys back on, so I'm the last one to get on the stage. I'm taking the most hits out of everybody. Ribs, back of the head, the head. But my thing is like, fuck that. We got to get out of here because it's going to turn into a riot at this point. So we get back on stage. Was the crowd yelling during all this? Oh what was the God, crowd man, doing? They're yelling. They're going nuts. It's just, dude, it's total fucking chaos, man. So I get back on stage. I said, yo, we got to fucking go. Get out of here right now. So we run, we run, to, the, uh, we run to the tour manager, Gus. I said, Gus, we got to get the fuck out of here. Gus stops us. Now, Gus got the doorway blocked from the side of the stage. He said, nope. 
He said, we got to finish this show. He said, because if we don't finish this show, these motherfuckers are going to kill us, man. He said, the show must go on. He said, get your ass back out here and finish the show. I said, Gus, are you serious? He said, he said man, I've been doing this a long time. If we don't finish this show, these motherfuckers are going to kill us. So by this time, people are moshing the pit. It's getting worse and worse. It's fights breaking out. DJ Head gets back up on the turntables. He, he's mixing the songs. He's putting on, uh, he's starting, he's cueing a Just Don't Give a Fuck. Mm. So the crowd starts to calm down. Proof goes and gets George Clinton from the P-Funk All-Stars, who's also a native Detroiter, brings him on stage. Proof got the mic. He got George Clinton underneath his arm. Hey, this how motherfuckers from Detroit do it. Y'all like that shit? So then the crowd, people stop fighting. It's like, hell yeah. He's like, this is how we do this shit every night. I was like, uh, no, we don't. We don't get our ass whooped every night. Next thing I know, M does, he does, still don't, he don't, he does, just don't give a fuck, and he does, still don't give a fuck. And the crowd went completely fucking nuts. I gotta say, man, even though we had the fight and the riot, that is the most memorable show, man. And then we got on a tour bus that night. We come home. We're on our way back east. I get a call from my mom's. And um, mom said, hey, uh, you know it was all over the news that you... She said, you know it was all over the news that you and a little white boy starting riots down there in San Francisco. I said, mom, that's not how it happened. She said, I'm going to tell you something. Don't let them get you in no trouble. She said, I love you, but I'll talk to you later. She said, it's all over the news. It's all on the front page. I was like, shit. So... That was one of the most memorable times, man. Wow. And the next day, we all woke up with bumps and bruises and hickeys and shit and lumps. But I'd do that shit again. I'd do it again, man. Yeah, sounds like a good time. It was. Yeah. What was your first encounter with Death Row? <sighs> uh, Source Awards. 1999 Source Awards. Uh, man, you got you to gotta realize that was at the end of an era. Three years prior, Tupac and Biggie was killed in L.A. And we're on, we were on the turf in L.A. during the whole East Coast, West Coast beef between New York and L.A., and between Death Row and Bad Boy, and M had inherited Dr. Dre's beef by signing with Dre. M was now the prodigy of Dr. Dre. Dre left Death Row, shoved him like that. Dre getting back on, got this, this white rapper that's ended up being the best rapper in the fucking world, Suge had a problem with it. He was like, you know what? That kid need to be with us over at Death Row. And that's how it began. We really didn't, honestly, we didn't see that coming, man. Because it was like, okay, if Eminem, Eminem's a white kid, nobody looking for him. He ain't got nothing to do with the beef. Right. From Detroit. That shit with Dre and Suge, that's your shit. That's how everybody looked at it, including myself. So when Def Row approached M at the 1999 Source Awards, the way they had it set up, the bodyguards could not sit with their, with their artists. You had to stand off to the side. But the way they had it set up, they strategically had certain people sit with certain people knowing that it might be a beef or not be a beef. You would think they would sit them on different sides of the, the auditorium, but they didn't. Right, right. So, M was walking to his seat. I'm standing off to the side. And M was cut off on his way to his seat. And all these guys in red shirts surrounded him. And I'm looking at M's face and I'm looking at these guys. I'm like, shit, something ain't right. So I start making my way around to come up the aisle. And next thing I know, you see all these guys talking about death row, motherfucker, death row. Death row, motherfucker, death row. So by this time, I, I cut in 
I step in front of him. I push the guys back. I'm like, yo, what the fuck going on here, man? He said, death row, motherfucker. This, this, this death row about. This death row life. I was like, death row? What does it got to do with him? He said, hey, man, Suge sent him a message. I was like, oh, shit. Mm. We in the middle of this Dre and Suge shit. So I got him up out of there. Took him backstage. So now backstage, I'm calling Dre's bodyguards. I call Dre. I mean, Look, man, we got a serious issue, man. Death Row is here, and they trying to fight. They trying to do whatever they gonna do. We ain't having it. So I got in backstage. I went through the source security. They got us backstage. So now we backstage because I don't know who's who. I'm Detroit. I ain't thinking about no red and blue. I'm thinking about anybody that's going to get within that three foot space, look like they about to do something, I'm dropping your ass. I'm dropping you. Well, so you I don't give a no red or blue. You're on serious oh, uh, man, alert it, 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 at that dude, point. At that point, it was high alert. Yeah. It was high alert. So when I called Dre and his people, uh, let them know what was going on. At that point, Dre had already did his presentation. Him and his people, they got out of there. So it was just me and M. We in, basically, I had M in a corner. And I was standing here. Now, mind you, I was about 75 pounds heavier, a lot more solid. So you couldn't even see him behind me. So the whole time, I'm on knockout mode or breakneck mode. You know, I'm more dangerous with my hands than I am with a gun. So that's, you couldn't even come up without possibly getting injured. So Eminem ended up doing... When he got his opportunity, he ended up doing his presentation. Matter of fact, he handed he handed the award to DMX. And then after that, we got out of there. We called the limo. This is where it gets fucked up. We called the limo. Def Row is still sitting out there waiting for us. Called the limo. Tell the limo pull up. We'll be out in five minutes. The limo pulls up. We're trying to get to the seat of the crowd. We're coming out. The limo's pulling off. As we're coming out, Death Row's behind us. So I'm like, shit. And so we had, I told him, I said, man, whatever you do, paparazzi is out here. Take many autographs. Do many autographs you can. Do all the interviews that you can. I said, because these dudes are not going to do nothing to you while you're on camera. So whenever, if you go back and you look at the old footage, as he's doing interviews and autographs, you'll see him. And then you'll see the middle of my back. We're like back to back. Oh, there's footage of this. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. It's, we're, we're back to back to make sure that nobody do nothing. Then the, eventually the limo came back around. We all get in the car. We pull off. We get out of there. Man. What was Eminem saying during all this? He was like, man, I, oh, shit. Well, it was well, like, this motherfucker's well, trying to kill us, man. They, what are they trying to do? What do they, what do they want? I don't understand. What do they want? I say, hey, man, they want you to sign with them. Instead of instead of being with Dre, but of oh, course oh, you guys knew that at the time. No, that's when we found out that day. They they told us that. With all this stuff going on, were you worried that Eminem was gonna die on your watch? Shit, man, we were all worried, man, that something can happen to us on our watch, man. You gotta understand something. I was under a lot of pressure, man. Uh, three years prior, Pac was killed. Biggie was killed. M could not die on my fucking watch, man. I don't give a damn what the other bodyguards have done after me. Had I not did my job, those bodyguards would be unemployed. And, and the one thing that I want to say that probably irritates me the most is that I'm not looking for no attaboys or credit, man, but people don't realize my contribution to hip-hop. I kept this fucking dude alive, man, in the worst part of hip hop. The worst part. 96, Pac was killed. Right after that, a few months later, Biggie was killed. Jam Master J was killed not too long after that. And then I got Eminem in the middle of the most notorious beef in hip hop between, really between, Three labels between Suge and Dre and Suge and Puffy. So it was a it was a duality 
a beef going on at the same time during the time I was protecting this guy. Right. I had to be able to outthink what the opposition was doing at all times, man. But I didn't know what their intentions were. You know? Kept yeah. this guy alive, man. I, you know, I did my job, man. Everything ain't always about, about shooting somebody or killing somebody. My strategy, man, I was strategic. Some of your most successful military gen generals, man, it's about strategy. You attack from the weak side. You hit them in the flank. You hit them up front. You lead them down a valley. You attack from up top. You're talking about art of war. That's everything I did to keep this guy alive, man. But nobody really recognizes that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not looking for a day on Black History Month or no shit like that, but what I'm just saying, look at what I did. Because right. if I didn't do my job, y'all wouldn't have this guy. Right. Yeah. Did you ever have to pull your gun on anybody? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. there anything you can talk about? Um, I will talk about one in particular. Um, <laughs> this is actually kind of funny. Um, to me, it is. Anyway, I was back home in Detroit, and I pull up to a gas station. And I got my family in the car. And I'm getting, I'm getting a full tank of gas, and I'm pumping gas. And this guy, this white guy, gets out of his car on the opposite side of the pump. He's, hey, I mean, you the motherfucker that wrote the book, Shady Business? I said, yeah. He said, hey, man, I got something for you, dog. So he opens up his car door. He reaches under his seat. I pull my 40 cal out. The guy reaches under the seat, and he turns around real quick. He said, hey, man, I want you to sign my book. I said, hey, man, you almost got shot, man. I said, who you want me to make that out to? Oh, so I signed it, man. But he was real aggressive in, the, in his actions, man. But uh, in, in the line of duty, um, as a bodyguard, you, you know, you, you're hired to protect people. I will say this, though. I have been certified by at least three different states, man. I was certified here in the state of California uh, as a PPO. Um, I went through the first uh, eight weeks. I was only civilian in the California Highway um, Patrolman Academy. Uh, I'm not a police officer, but I went through the first eight weeks of some of the training uh, offsite. Uh, at that time, I was able to carry in 44 different, state, 44 different states, super high police uh, security clearance, super high security clearance. So um, I'm above the normal citizen, civilian, but in some ranks, I can do some stuff that police officers can't. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. But that being said, to answer your question, man, um, Anytime you pull your weapon, you have to be mindful of all the laws, rules, and regulations. And you have to be in the right. You have to be in the right. right and right. anything that comes down, it has to come down to self-defense. And all those stories can be seen and read in this book, Shady Business. So at one point, you guys had a trip to Hawaii. Hmm. Yeah. And had some issues with death row. Yeah. Um, mm, it was supposed to be a vacation, but it wasn't. Right, your wife was there and everything, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. Actually, we all had our wives. Some people had their kids with them. Oh, and, wow. Um, unfortunately, we thought it was going to be a vacation, but it ended up turning into a, a fucking problem. Were they on the same plane as Snoop when they flew in? Right. The same plane with Snoop. They flew in, so when the plane landed in Honolulu, the doors opened and were met by Honolulu finest and um, by 20 cops. About 20 cops. So Snoop flew in first. Snoop flew in first. But then we had fragments of the guys on our flight, but they laid real low. Oh, I see. So yeah. they were on your flight, too. Yeah. We had a, it was a few fragments of the guy, but they laid real low. Mm. See, you got to understand something, man. Now, this is something that I found out recently. Oh, this, 
this, this is a hard part to talk about, but I, I wrote it in the book. So you have guys that was in that camp at that time that were also police officers or dirty cops. And they talk about that on the Welcome to Death Row and all the other documentaries that came out on Lifetime and stuff like that. So when they travel, matter of fact, I talk about it in the book, Shady Business, man, where some of the guys they had in their camp were either former police officers or were police officers that rode with death row, which is no secret. It just so happened, man. This is the thing people I told the shit 20 years ago. Before everybody said, I told it 20 years ago. I told everything 20 years ago. Right. Ain't no snitch shit. I talked about what what happened. What what happened when you guys got off the plane? Oh, man. We ended up getting escorted by Honolulu police, man. And we had to gather up our kids, our wives, and had to be rushed to uh, the transport van, the shuttle van, and everybody getting their luggage. So now it goes from getting your luggage. It goes from, ah, oh, we're in Hawaii. We're going to have a nice time. We're going shopping, coconut drinks, and all this other shit. So, oh, shit. To putting on bulletproof vests, loading guns, putting on vests in the van. All you could hear, when we got in that van, nobody said shit. All you could hear was the locking and loading of 40 cows, Desert Eagles, the Velcro, a bulletproof vest putting on. So all you heard was click. Clack, snip, snap, shh, 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 clack, click, clack, clack. That's all you heard. Nobody said shit in a 15 passenger van. Uh-huh. And as we're riding past the front part of the airport, you see a sea of death row guys that got on red and black death row jerseys. So they came to watch and witness the Dr. Dre. Snoop Dogg break up to make a reunion. All right, right. What happened when you guys? So would you guys go straight to the hotel after that? Ah, uh, man, twenty years ago, man. Some of the stuff I'm not gonna remember uh, detail by detail. But eventually, we got to the hotel and we had to. Uh, when was the keep show? Security with us. The show was like the next day. Okay, so yeah. you guys went to the, uh, did Death Row try to go to the show? Oh yeah, of course. That's the reason why they came. They, the, came, they came to interrupt the breakup to make up reunion. Weren't they, they were staying at the same hotel as the show, right? They were staying, they were, they were scattered about. Oh, uh, there were some okay. guys that were staying at the hotel that we were at. Uh, we had to end up having the bodyguards. This is crazy. So, you're talking about Everybody from Dre, Snoop, M, Proof. Um, no, he wasn't there, but uh, who else was there? I think Warren G. There was a lot. It was a lot of cats there. It was a lot of artists there who had their bodyguards, and then each bodyguard had to have mm-hmm. one to two Honolulu policemen stand on their door while we sleep at night, while uh-huh. we're with our families. And they did that shit around the clock. What was M thinking at the time? What was he what was he talking about? He was always so focused on the show, man. I mean, real talk, man, we all everybody had a little nervousness nervousness about them. I'm not I'm not gonna try to downplay that. But we're here to get money. You see what I'm saying? M was here to get money. Dre was here to get money. He was there to get money. So you can't you can't cancel the show. Then the opposition wins. Right. Did anybody go try to talk? Did Snoop or anybody go, go to try to talk to him? Nah, man. Them cats stayed on their side. We stayed on our side. They didn't. Did they make it in the show? No. 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 I can recall, and I wrote about it in the book. A couple of the guys that was with Death Row tried to flash badges to get in, and they wouldn't let them in. They got shut down at the door because we had already prepped the uh, in-house security and the Honolulu police and all that other stuff. So, um, hmm. that's where it gets interesting trying to leave. Right. So, you know, so you guys get on the plane, and they're on the plane with you. These guys are on the plane with us, man. 
on the plane. All of them? Shit, it was enough. Because you got to remember, at that time, I was the only bodyguard Eminem had. So it was me, and then you had M, I'm protecting M, and then, of course, I got to pe- protect Paul Rosenberg, and I got to protect Proof. So you talk about one guy doing a five-man detail. So I had to be able to talk to flight attendants. Can you move this guy to first class, slide them a tip? Here's hundred dollars. I know that seat's open. Can you slide this guy up so I can keep everybody in a line of sight? So sometimes, man, you talking about you don't want a flight from from Honolulu to LA at six hours, where your client get to go to sleep, and you really haven't had any sleep already. So you have to stay. Your eyes have to be peeled, and then you're looking at the fact. Okay. If I get into it with this guy, they're going to emergency land this plane. So now you're talking about an air marshal type situation. You're talking about that's federal regulation. But I got a job to do. So what these guys ended up doing, some of the guys from death row, they decided, they see me sitting with my wife at the time. And uh, the guy looks at me. He looks at me. He just walked past. And he looks at me like, I told my wife at that time, I said, hey, I got to go. So the guy walks. I get up. I walk behind him. I walk behind him. Another guy from death row sits in my seat. It's wow. talking shit to my then wife. So now I got to make a decision. Mm. I got a job to do. But I also, I'm leaving my wife naked. But I, I, I also told her, I said, look, when I get up, these guys are going to come. I prepped her pretty good. Because I, I know how these guys think. Never, meet, never met them before. I knew how they think. So I get up front. The guy goes to try to talk to him. I say, hey, man, what are you doing, man? He said, man, I need to talk to him. I said, man, you're not talking to him, man. He said, man, I can talk to him. I said, dog, let me tell you, you're not talking to him, man. I said, listen, man, we're in the air. This shit go down. I said, I've already contacted Interscope. I already talked to LAPD. I said, they're waiting for us to land. That's one of the things I had to do prior to when I found out they was on the flight. The pilots knew. The airline stewardess knew what was going on. And she told the guy, I said, you need to go back to your seat. So M says, you know what? The guy wants to wake M up. I said, you're not going to wake him up. He said, man, fuck you, man. I said, let me tell you something, dog. I said, you're not going to win this fight. I said, you're not going to win this fight, man. I said, look, y'all got me outnumbered. I said, but somebody's going to get hurt and go to the hospital. And it's not going to be me. So, and by that time, M wakes up. He said, man, what's going on? I said, man, it's Captain Death Row trying to holler at you. He said, man, you know what, man? He said, he said, Nash, fall back. He said, what you want to say to me? So the guy leans in, and he's talking to M. And Paul's like, man, why are you la-? I said, hey, boss man said, let him say what he got to say. So M leans back. He said, well, I'm not working with y'all, man. He said, man, y'all think y'all going to strong, mar- strong arm me to come work with y'all? He said, I'm not working with y'all. He said, I'm signed with Dre. My alliance is to Dre. So the guy was like, then the guy, he got up and he walked back and he grilled me. I said, hey, man, I said, look, I said, I'm going to tell you. LAPD is waiting. They already at the airport waiting. I said, so you and your team, y'all might want to figure out how y'all going to handle this. I said, we're not trying to get into no shit in the air. I said, we came here to be on vacation, not that bullshit. So the guy goes back to his seat. I make sure Paul and Emma's okay. Then I go, I go back to sit in my seat. And that's when my wife at that time was telling me, uh, yeah, when you got up, the one guy came and talked to me. He was trying to talk to me. And he was saying all kind of crazy shit. She said, I put him in check. And he ended up leaving. Um, so when we landed in L.A., we ended up having like a team of LAPD officers in uniform and undercover pick us up and we had two shuttle buses and two limos to create diversion. Mm. To create diversion. So at, when we got there, the way it was done, we was in the back part of the airport. So we had two different shuttle buses leaving two different two different directions and two limos leaving two different directions. I mean, one time we got in one limo, slid out and got over in the other limo and the limos did like that. What did Eminem have to say about death row and all that? 
we all had the same mindset, man. Like, what the fuck this got to do with us? This has nothing to do with us. You understand what I'm saying? Mm. It's like it has nothing to do with us. We're from Detroit. This ain't part of the East Coast, West Coast beef. We're Midwest. We're not East Coast. Uh, we have nothing to do with Suge and Dre. And was like, I'm just a white rapper, man. He said, what the fuck? This don't have nothing to do with Dre. I came on after Dre left. It would be different if M signed while he was still with Dre over at Death Row. And it was like a custody battle of a child. You, you understand what I'm right, saying? Right. And that's not what it was. This was a new birth. A new client. A new artist. So at one point, you guys are having uh, money issues. Oh, and yeah. and you're pretty unhappy with your situation. You've been trying to get him to pay you a fair compensation mm -hmm. for uh, for your work. Right. And at one point, you just you you've, uh, you feel like you've gotten everything out of it, and you're ready to quit. Yeah. And why why exactly did you quit working with him? I think for me, man, um, I was exhausted. Had I been there just to do, excuse me, the bodyguard work, then I would have had more energy to be the bodyguard. But you got to understand something. Not only was I the bodyguard, I was the personal driver, I was the personal assistant, I was the butler, um, I was his confidant, I was his friend. I wore about seven hats, man. So when everybody was in New York and all the other parts of the world, it was always me and Eminem, one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, there was a point in time where, and I spoke about in the book, the guy would lose, Eminem would lose every fucking thing. His cell phone, his wallet, his credit card. He'd lose everything. If it wasn't, if it wasn't fucking attached to him, he'd, he'd lose it. So I had to carry his phones, carry his wallet, carry his ID, carry his credit card, and... Anytime he wanted to spend money, he had to have permission. At this time, this guy's triple platinum. Why so, did he have to have permission to spend his own I, money? Well, here's, here's the thing. Now, being 49 years old, I get it. But when I was 28, I didn't get it. Too many artists die broke because of the frivolous spending. Right, so, right. But, but when you're a 29-year-old bodyguard <coughs> and you're with your client and he wants to go to the tanning salon, he's like, Naz, I need to go get a tan. I'm like, but you don't have no money. He said, man, put it on your car and I'll reimburse you later. So a lot of time, my credit card became his credit card. So what I would do for the sake of embarrassment for him we go to this tanning salon, and people are like, how can I help you? I'm like, no, you can't help me. All this shit happened the last time I was here. So I, nothing y'all can do for me. I said, but he needs, he needs to tune up. So, And then we get a receipt. I pay for it, and I send the receipts back to the office. So at one point, you get a call from the bank. You, you've gotten your bonuses, and yeah. you've gotten your pay, and you get a call from the bank. Yeah. Oh, that's a bad time right there, man. That's a really bad time. Um, at that time, my my wife, she worked at the particular bank that the checks were drawn on. Uh, that was December thirty first, December thirtieth, nineteen ninety nine. Yeah. I told Emma, I said, hey, man, um, I'm resigning. I said, I got some more security in place for you so you guys won't be naked. You'll have proper protection. Guys with light. Retired police officers, you know, military cats. I gave him the best. Didn't you give him an, um, an ultimatum, though, right? I gave him an ultimatum. I said, hey, man, look, if you guys are not going to pay me, I'm going to resign. I said, but this is what I want. I want $100,000 a year. I want $100,000 a year. I want to be able to um, have particular off days because you got you to remember, here's, here's the part that people don't know about 
bodyguards. Bodyguards, accountants, lawyers, whoever. They're humans. They're humans protecting a superhero or a super MC or a super rock star. So that means I had kids. At that time, I had a four-year-old and I had a six-month-old. Here's a story that people don't know. The day that I left to go on the road with Eminem, my, my middle son, my second son, was two, months, was two months old. My second son was two months old. The next day, Sunday, he was being christened. My second son was being christened at church on that Sunday, and I was not a part of it. Oh, wow. So even when I go back and look at the pictures of seeing her and the family standing there, I'm not in the picture. I can't get that back, man. I can't get that back. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. But the fans don't know that shit. M don't know that. What happened when the bank called you? When the bank called me about the $6,000, they retracted the funds. Now, mind you, that check had cleared a month prior to, because we actually got the Christmas bonus in November. So when I told him in December that I'm resigning, you know, his business team went and retracted, the, they canceled the check. Now, mind you, the money spent. Mm, the money spent. It's 30 days later, man. The money spent. Here's my question to you. How in the fuck are you able to do that 30 days later? And I work for you. So the wife, boss, came to her and said, you know what? You need to get this money back in this account. We're going to fire you. She said, well, the money, was, the money spent. We paid bills with it. Just that and the other. Said, don't matter. These people want their money back. Mm. Out of New York. Mm. And what'd you do? I went ape shit. I went ape shit. I went Detroit. I went all Detroit on it, man. And what I mean by that, man, you don't play with our money. You don't play with our family. You don't do that. You don't fuck with our money or our family. And uh, I called Paul. Actually, I called him first. We got into an argument over the phone. I said, yo, man, what the fuck? I said, what are y'all doing canceling checks? He said, man, fuck that shit, man. You don't want to work for us no more, man. We canceled motherfucking checks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's talking real tough on the phone. Mm. I said, dude, don't talk to me like that. I said, please don't talk to me like that, man. I said, because you're talking to somebody that knows your every move. I know where you're at all times of the day, what you do, who you're thinking about, who you're going to see, everything that you do. I said, so don't do that, man. We had a big falling out. I called Paul, and I leave Paul Rosenberg a message. This is where I messed up. It wasn't a threat. I said, hey, man, y'all need to get that fucking money back in my account. I said, well, we got a problem, man. I said, y'all gonna get my wife fired. Y'all pull the money that I've already earned. And so now you put me in a tight. I mean, the fucking money, man. I said, some shit gonna go down. <laughs> Paul takes the voicemail, sends it to the state police. No, sends it to his attorney. His attorney sends it to the state police. The state police file a PPO. By this time, I get on the phone, I'm talking to M. I'm driving to M's house this way. The wire is going over the phone to the state police mm. as I get to M's house to find out what's up with my money. I get there, M and Kim, I knock on the door. M's not there. Kim answers the door. The house is in total, complete fucking panic. Oh my God, it's Nancy. He's coming to kill us. Uh. I'm like, man, that's not what it was said. 
But I did go over there with a bulletproof vest on, heavy artillery, because you don't know how this shit gonna go. Right. You know, I was hoping to talk, but I was prepared for war. So what? So what happened? You pull up to the house. I pull up to the house. Talking to Kim, I knock on the door. Pandemonium breaks out in the house. At that time, he was staying with Kim, which was his baby mama. Kim comes to the door holding Haley. And I said, look, I don't want no problem. I'm here to see your, see your boyfriend. So I'm here to see him. We need to have a conversation about this money. She said, Naz, we don't want no problems. I said, I'm not here to give y'all no problem. I just want my money. She said, well, he's not here. I said, okay. I said, well, where are you at? She said, I don't know. She said, please leave. I said, I'll do that. So as I turned to walk away, M's pulling up the street, high speed. I see him. He was down at the end of the block watching. I'm walking down the stairs. I show him my hands. I said, I need to talk to you. But I got my hands here. I said, I need to talk to you. He jumps out the truck. He pulls his shirt up. He pulls his shirt up. He brandishes 38, nickel plate of 38, I believe it was. The same gun that I took him to go get registered. The same gun I took him to go get registered. He's brandishing at me. But what he don't know, I got my 40 cal in my coat pocket here. Not underneath my coat, but here. I got a bulletproof vest on. I got two extra magazines. I said, look, man, we need to talk. He said, man, fuck that. Get off my property, man. I said, nah, I'm not going nowhere, man. I said, you need to let that shirt down. I said, before I take it personal, I said, I didn't come here to follow that nonsense. So I he said, was flashing his gun at you he at flashed the time? Gun. He flashed the gun. He pulled the shirt up. He yeah. showed the shit. I didn't run. I still right. I still right there on his porch, right, right at the bottom of his porch on the sidewalk. He was on the grass. I said, "Hey man, I ain't going nowhere, dog." Until we had this conversation, and um, we went back and forth, back and forth. I said, "I tell you what, man. I said I need my money, dog. I said I earned that shit, and I need my fucking money." He said, "Man, I ain't giving you shit." He said, man, you gonna leave me, man? You gonna leave me? The motherfuckers out there definitely gonna get me, man? You gonna leave me like that? He said, that ain't loyalty, man. That ain't loyalty. I said, Psh, dude. I said, I've been more than loyal to you, man. I said, I don't need my fucking money. So. Where was your hands and everything at the oh, time? At that point in time, when he kept flashing the gun, I took my hands like this and I slid them inside my coat pocket. But what he don't know, when I slid inside my right pocket, I already got one in the chamber. And I'm pulling. Because I don't know what his intentions is. He got his, he's brandishing. I already got the jump on him. I already got one in the chamber. And I'm talking to him, but I'm pulling. A black leather coat on. I'm, I'm dressing all black. And I'm pulling. But you can't see it because my thing is like, look, man, just came over here to talk to you, yada, yada, yada. Man, fuck that. I said, you know what? I said, dog, I loved you. I loved you like a brother. I said, but this is bullshit. I said, look, you know what, man? I'm out. So I get in the car. He walks behind the car. And he says to me, that ain't loyalty, man. You left me, man. The motherfucker's trying to get me and shit. Them meaning death row. Right. I said, hey man, I love you like a brother, man. I said, but you fucked up, dog. I gave you an option. Pay me more. My thing was, I was operating off integrity. That's how I was raised. If people can't respect you for your worth, you don't fuck with them. You know? And that, I was only 29 then. We're talking about a 29-year-old thinking like a 50-year-old. And, um, and I pulled off, as I was pulling off, I could see him in the rearview mirror talking about, that ain't loyalty, man, that ain't loyalty. And I'm going to tell you something. He was hurt that I left him, and I was hurt. 
that I was leaving him. Because I felt, honestly, I felt guilty about leaving him. I still do to this day, man. I've never, I never said that in an interview, man. Never. Mm. Some Barbara Walter shit, Cam. It's pretty fucking good, man. Right, right. Wow, that's pretty good, man. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and truth be told, man, no matter what we went through, I, I, I never want nobody to lay a fucking finger on them, man. Mm. I, you know, we we were like we were we were like brothers, man. Once we got past the business of the shit, we were like brothers. We had we had a relationship where we could he could be thinking something, he'd give me a look, and I knew what was up. It was like a non-spoken communication, man. Because when you're around somebody 16, 24, when you're around somebody 24 hours a day, that's technically what it was, for a year, really, that's just not a year. You're talking about, honestly, man, you got to multiply that shit like by nine or 10. That's a lot of hours in conversation you're putting together with people, you know? Right, right. All day. Yeah. So what, what happened afterwards? What was the aftermath of everything? We went through the legal shit. Um, I had to file um, I had to file a, a lawsuit on them to get the money back. Ended up getting the money back. Um, <laughs> but I had the strong army. And the way I had to get the money back, I said, all right, look, man, um, I'm going to need the money back. You go to court, I need the money back, but I'm going to have to subpoena your wife and all your, your side chicks to court. All right. I got the money back like that. Mm. It's fucked up. It's a dirty game. But you got to do what you got to do, right? I needed that money, man. The money was already spent, and right. I had already earned it. Yeah. Um, but let me say this, man. In hindsight, I don't know if I could have done anything differently. I think everything played out the way it was supposed to play out. And um, I'd do it all over again, man. I'd do everything all over again. But I will say, though, I'm glad he didn't shoot me, and I'm glad I didn't shoot him, because we both had the potential to kill each other, man. Mm. That's real. That shit would have been okay corral. Yeah. I'm just glad that it didn't, it didn't turn into that, man. And that right there gives me hope that one day him and I can sit down and have a conversation. You know, you get a lot of people creating rumors about him dying and all this other shit. And they ask me, say, man, how do you feel about Eminem, you know, still living? I said, man, I hope the motherfucker let it be 100. I said, because that gives me more time for him to change his ways. And say, you know what? Let me have a conversation with Nas. Because truth be told, man, he is not done with one of the seven steps of his AA. And one of the seven steps of his AA is to heal and mend all past relationships that you had a problem with people. Especially since me being there when you first got your drug addiction. I'm step one. Hmm. So, I leave that door open, man. Yeah. I do. At one point, proof was going around yeah. squashing beefs with everybody like Insane Clown Posse yeah. and I guess a couple other dudes. Did anybody ever reach out to you at that time? No. Mm. No. Did you Proof ever run into those guys again? Uh, you know what? I run into Insane Clown Posse all the time. Uh, I've run into Proof a couple of times. I run into Bazaar recently. Bazaar had a shitload of stuff to tell me. Um, matter of fact, I me and Bazaar was on the same flight from Detroit to Atlanta. And we had a chance to talk, and he, he shared a lot of stuff with me, man, about this, the, uh, the aftermath after I left mm. and how I was an intricate part of that camp, and they could tell with me leaving how things had changed. Um, I ran into DJ Head, um, members of that camp, 
the promotions team. I don't have any ill will toward that guy, man. And you know, you gotta here's the thing. We're old now. We're fucking old, man. Yeah. We're fucking we're twenty it's twenty years later. Look, I got gray in my beard. I'm not as big as I was. I was a lot bigger. I got gray in my beard. I'm sure Eminem got some gray hair, but he's dying it. I mean, we all went through that shit. I died my shit up until about three, four years ago. Listen, we're not kids anymore. We're grown ass men. We've either we have either lived half our life or at least two thirds of our life at this point. So now it's time to come to the table. Let's sit down. Let's laugh. Let's joke. Bury the hatchet. I don't want to fucking battle no more, man. I've been reaching out to these cats, man, for the last 20 years. Mm. And it's not just for monetary reasons. Um, because I really felt like I felt like we were friends. And all friends at some point are going to fall out if you're truly friends. But that being said, um, I've brought some lucrative deals to their table. To their attorneys and to their managers. I got a billionaire right now that's the blockbuster films that wants to do the Eminem movie right now. Two years ago, he wanted to do it. He left it open. He said, hey, if you ever get him on board, we're going to murder the box office. It's going to be the biggest movie of all times. He said, but you got to get M on board. I said, I can't get M on board. M has to get M on board. Mm. His manager, his attorney. And here's the thing, man. I'm talking about 20 years now. How many more albums you going to do? Do anybody else want to hear you? And I'm not saying that as a diss. He's the greatest rapper of all time. The dude is dope. Even at damn near 50, he's dope. But you got younger people coming up. MGK is the younger version of Eminem. All day. And one of the reasons why I ended up leaving was because when I would go to get reimbursed for what I had spent, that became a problem. So I'm like, okay, I don't need a tan. So why y'all mad at me? Because I got receipts for the tan that he got. And, and instead of him not being able to do what he wanted to do, I've always saved face for him to make sure that whatever he wanted, make sure he had it. So, but if it was some money that needed to be sent, they wanted to know why, when, what for, how much, this, that, and the other. Tell them we're going to do something else. This guy's the one that's generating the money. Eminem's generating the money. He don't want to hear fucking no coming from his accountant and his lawyers. He know he want to do this shit now. But then when they can't do it, then I take the hit, make sure he got it to get reimbursed later. Gotcha. So when I'm always constantly fighting to get reimbursed later, that's where the battle became became uh, more than I can have. So you know what? I'm leaving. Right. I'm leaving. I said, I'm not doing this shit. But you know, because I took a leave of absence from my job at GM. I didn't quit. Guys that were in the camp were quitting their jobs. I said, those dudes, hey, man, don't quit your job. Take a leave of absence. Pimp the game, man. Take a leave of absence. Go back and work a little bit. Take another leave. Go back out on the road. When the tour's over, you go back to work. You work for a little bit. You take a leave of absence. You go back out on tour. Guys didn't want to do that. Everybody just, went, they, they threw all their cards in, man. Is there anything you left uh, out of the book <sighs> you could share? Man, I left a lot of shit out, man. And, and even to this day, I can't talk about it out of uh, respect for his daughter. Oh, okay. You know, because he's a father. Right, right. Um, and actually, the, the, the edition that you read, this edition right here, this is the third edition. The first edition was fire, man. I had attorneys go back through it, man. They pulled so much shit out of this. Oh, you can't say this. You can't talk about this. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do this. Because at that time, the first edition was written from an angry place. Mm. You see what I'm saying? So I didn't pull no punches. But even with me not pulling any punches, it was some stuff. I was just like, you know what? 
at that time I had a family. I said, if I tell this, I put my family in jeopardy, not based off of Eminem, but just based off of the industry. You understand what I'm saying? Some things mm-hmm. you got to be able to have the foresight to say, you know what? How am I going to feel about this shit in 20 years? What was your first interactions or impressions of him, of Eminem, when you first met him? He's very elusive. He didn't feel like he needed a bodyguard. He was actually perturbed by the idea of somebody giving him a bodyguard. Everything that he did was to <laughs> uh, evade me. He just, it was, it was like a scavenger hunt. I was constantly following this guy. He would mm. do shit like disappear, I gotta find him. Go here, I gotta follow him. And he'd be like, man, I don't need you to follow him. Say, look, man, this is what they hired me to do. That was like, that was like the first week. Uh, then he would make a lot of stage dives during his performance to see what I would do. It was like an audition. Mm. A lot of people think you get hired as a bodyguard. It's really an audition. Can this guy keep up with me? I'm gonna do the most craziest shit to see if this guy got my back. I'm gonna put myself in the most messed up situation to see if this guy's gonna save me. So I remember Hammerstein Ballroom. I'll never forget this in New York. This guy jumps in the crowd. The crowd takes him all the way back. I mean, he jump in the crowd, do a stage dive. They take him all the way to the back. It's like 3,500 to 5,000 people, man. They take him all the way to the back. I'm like, okay, if I jump in, I can't get back faster than they moving him back. They take him all the way to the back, and they bring him all the way to the front. In a matter of 30 seconds, boom, 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 and he gets to the front. I grab him, snatch him back on the stage. And mind you, as they take him to the back, as he stays down, he's still doing his show. Yeah. He's still doing his show. And he lifts his hand out. I snatch him up. He's back on the stage. That was the point where he was like, oh, this dude got me. He got me. He got my back. So he knew if he went in, I was going to get him out. It was never no second thought. Like, oh, man, if I jump in, this guy going to get me. I, I, I remember we were in uh, Auschwitz, Germany, some shit like that. It was like fucking Hitler's greatest hits town or some shit like that. People were getting stabbed over there, man. Like weeks before we got there doing shows, I said, dude, I'm going to need you not to do any stage dives. He said, fuck that. I'm doing a stage dive anyway. I said, man, stabbing people over here, man. He said, I'm doing a stage dive. You got me or you not? <laughs> I said, God. So when he do the stage dive, when he jump in, when he jump, I'm jumping. When he's in the air, I'm in the air. And it was key words. Certain words, brain damage, he jumped, just don't give a fuck, rock bottom, still don't give a fuck. Those are the four songs. He jumped. And it was certain words. When he jumped, when I know he jumped, I jumped. I'm sure it's a photographer somewhere that was taking pictures from the side of the stage. When you see him jump, we both in the air at the same time. So as he's jumping, I'm grabbing an ankle. And we're talking about mid-air. So that way, when they go to try to pull him to the back, I can snatch him back, mm. pull him back, throw him back on the stage, and he never stopped the show. The show was going on in the air, in the crowd, in the mosh pit, back to the stage. Right, right. That's why he deserved to have the gym shoot deal with Jordan, because he was always in the fucking air, man. A lot of people don't understand why he deserved to have the Jumpman deal. He was always in the air. Did he get a deal with Jordan? Yes. Uh, okay. This guy, used to, let me tell you this story, man. I never told this part. He would always, he would buy Jordans before every show. And buy shoes, buy gym shoes, go Jordan, we'll go Nike time, buy gym shoes. And he'd buy them, and if they get a scuff on them, he's not wearing them again. I can't tell you how many pair of gym shoes we left behind in hotels. And at the time, he would leave me. I said, you're not going to take them shoes? What you said? They got a fucking scuff on them. I see the one one time. I said, I'm not wearing those again. I can remember times closing the door, looking at these gym shoes like, God, those shoes are going to be worth so much fucking money. And I left them there. Damn. 
What I should have did was ran back. Oh, shit, I forgot something. Ran back up, grabbed the shoes, have a scuff on them. One time, that's it. Shit, you could have, if you had a picture oh of him. Oh, my God, man. With the shoes and then got him to sign it. Dude, I can't tell you. And I'm talking about during 1999 when I worked with him. I can't imagine over the past 20 years. I pretty, I'm pretty sure after about the third or fourth year, he probably got a little bit more frugal. But Nike Town, if he, if he did a show, you got to go to Nike Town first to get his outfit, to get his shoes. Hmm. You know where fucking Nike Town? There's no show. Okay, okay. Yeah. What prompted your decision to take the responsibility of of job of being his bodyguard? I was a music producer at the time. And um, I figured me taking on the job as a bodyguard, I had already been doing it, you know, as a producer that was also a bodyguard, you know. And um, when I got out of college, I was trying to work for the Secret Service or either FBI. And I didn't have much luck with that. I kept getting, I passed the test, I get on the list, wait, pass the test, get on the list, wait, didn't get hired. So when I got a call, from a guy who, who do bodyguard work. He said, hey man, I get a lot of celebrities coming to town. I got a company, we do this, we do that and the other. We protect them while they're here. Would you be willing to do that? I said, sure, why not? And while I was doing that, I did that for about six years. And then I got the call from Eminem and Paul Rosenberg and they called me and I did it and they liked the way I work and um, the rest is history. The rest is history. Yeah. How did you feel emotionally when you had to leave behind your life to guard his life on tour? Oh, man, that was a that was a tough decision, man. I consulted with my dad, my wife at that time, my pastor. I sat down. I sat down with a coalition. Say, hey, look, I don't know if I should do this. I think I think the one big thing, man, I, I will give it to my wife at that time. She said, you know what? You've been trying to get in the music game for a long time. Take it. She said, I got it. She said, I got it. Just do it. See what happens. And I was like, oh, man, you know, I'm trying to be a good dad. I don't want to give this up, raising my son, to go raise some man. Because that's pretty much what it was almost like doing, man. I'm... I'm babysitting. A bodyguard is a babysitter. I don't care what nobody say. Mm. And um, but I do it all over again, man. When I came home, man, everything was about family. I didn't hang out with friends. Everything was about family. So I, I would make up for lost time. We travel. We do certain things. We go shopping because I had the money. So we was doing big things, man. So you know, I, I made up for lost time. Yeah. Did you ever wish you would have stayed on just a yes. little bit longer? Yes. Yes. Nobody's ever asked me that question. I wish I would have stayed at least to the Up and Smoke tour. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't meant for me to stay. It wasn't meant for me to stay. I would have left after Proof got killed anyway. Proof was my um, Proof was my road dog, man. A lot of people don't know this, and this is probably I, I'm 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 giving an exclusive right here. Proof, that was my dude. Um, very healthy. Didn't eat. Didn't eat pork. Didn't drink. Didn't smoke. Didn't do drugs. But then when he got on that road and that tour, and Lord knows what happened after I left. When I left, it was like, it was almost like the preacher or the pastor or the dad, daddy's gone, we can do what we want. Mm. They used to call me Goody Two Shoes. That was M name for me. Man, you Goody Two Shoes. You don't ever do shit, man. We trying to do this. I don't want to do that shit, man. I'm here to protect you. I can't protect you if I'm high. I don't get high like that. I'm gonna have a drink. But all that shit y'all doing, I don't do. Let me do my job. So yeah, man, I, I have a lot of regrets because, you know, like I said, I would constantly watch the news when he was in court, 
where he was uh, potentially going to go to jail for pistol whipping ICP. Um, I watched that and I was like, oh man, this guy about to fuck it up. He about to blow it. I watched that. I watched, I watched everything he did, even to this day. I watched everything that he does. I have, you know what's crazy? This is so fucked up. I've never said this before, man. It's like, I'm a, I'm a distant fan. Mm. I'm a distant fan. Okay. But as, a, as an insider, I was there. So I keep tabs on him, just like he keeps tabs on me. He keeps tabs on everything that I do because his team has showed me that. They have uh-huh. showed me that, man. So it's, it's, a mutual, it's a mutual respect. It's a mutual respect. And, you know, and, I, and, and I do foresee us, you know, um, being able to sit down and kick it one day, man, before it's, as he said, his album is Curtain Calls, before it's Curtain Calls, we're going to sit down. We're going to chop it up. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. Did you embrace the job with open arms, or did you feel any hesitancy about taking the task on of protecting his life? I embrace with open arms, man. I've always been a go-getter. It's like, you know what? I, I see an opportunity for me to get in to do what I need to do. I was working for General Motors. I had a record label. I was trying to be the next uh, Motown, Barry Gordy, and a bunch of artists. And I was like, ah. If I take this job with M as his bodyguard, when we do these demos, I can slide into the back door and have these meetings with these execs. And that's what I was doing. So when M and M was in the, in the bed sleep, I would get up early and schedule meetings with Interscope and Def Jam and all these cats and meet with them. And um, of course, to no avail, nothing ever happened of it. But they would always say, hey, man, you got good stuff, but right now we're not looking for what you got. He said, y'all too far advanced for what we're trying to do. Nobody's doing what you're doing. You're too far advanced. Mm. So. Okay. Did you ever think or believe he would become the huge icon or success? Always. Always knew he was going to be huge. Always knew he was going to be huge. Um, when he did uh, Top of the Charts in London... That's when I realized. It was, it was two situations. Top of the charts in London. And when he did TRL MTV. The one that sticks out the most is TRL MTV. Uh, he did TRL MTV. Um, I, I don't know exactly know what day, but he was on. He was acting the fool. He had the white t-shirt on the blind hair. He did this thing, man, with Carson Daly. Oh, okay, okay. And... Um, he did his thing. We left out the side door, told the limo to pull up. The limo didn't pull up. He was at the end of the alley. So the back rock was through the alley. So we're coming down the alley, and we're walking, and there's about 100 kids, about 100 teenage girls. Oh, my God, that's Eminem. And they started yelling and hollering. Next thing you know, that 100 turned into about 500. Next thing you know, it was 1,000. And we're running. As we're running, the crowd is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. <coughs> and the limo got the flashing lights on. We just the crowd is coming this way, the crowd coming this way, they're closing in on us. So in this empty space, this is me and M running. So as we're running, I take him, I grab him in the midst of running, I throw him, I switch him, I throw him over my shoulder. I'm sure somebody got the video. He got on his gray jogging pants, he got on some George, he got on a white t-shirt. I throw him over my shoulder, and I'm like Barry Sanders running through the crowd. <laughs> and they're grabbing, they're pulling, they're pulling his pants down, they're ripping my shirt, they're ripping his shirt, they're grabbing him. I throw him in a limo, I jump in a limo, the limo pulls off. I was like, man, what the fuck? I said, dude, I said, you just cross into Michael Jackson's zone. And he laughed. He was like, man, I don't want to be that big. I said, it's too late. I said, it's too late. I said, you're here, man. That's when I realized that this dude is going to be huge. So he didn't want to be, uh, he didn't want to be that big. He didn't, it's not that he want to be that big. He didn't expect to be that big. He thought he was only going to sell like 500,000, go gold. But his biggest fear was to be like Michael Jackson, to be secluded, to not be able to leave um, 
his house not be able to enjoy the public. Um, that was his biggest fear. He didn't want to be like Wacko Jacko. Right. You remember that headline from back in the day? I don't. With Michael Jackson? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm telling my age right now. I'm 49. <laughs> yeah, probably about 20 years ago. But yeah, he didn't want to be that guy. Okay. He wanted to still be able to go out in public and this, that, and the other. I said, dude, I said, your life will never be the same, man. I said, your shit has changed. Mm. I knew it then. I knew, I told him, man, you're going to be the biggest thing that hip hop has ever seen, man. I said, not just hip hop, pop, rock and roll, across the board, man. And I, I believe he has, he, surpa- he surpassed Elvis sales. I think he was, was he the first artist to sell 100 million records total, I think. I think so, man. I think that just recently happened, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Yeah. I think I just recently read about that. Yeah. 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 When you were on a tour with him, did you ever feel any anxiety or regrets about taking the job? No. Um, never. Never. I, I wish we would have did things differently. But you can't control what happens on the road. You can leave to go on the road as a bodyguard. You can leave to go on the road as an artist. You can leave to go on the road as a DJ, a promotion guy. Whatever you think that you're about to do, it's not going to happen that way. It's going to do like this, and it's going to go far right, or it's going to go far left, or it's going to drop, or it's going to raise. You cannot predict what's going to happen. So I do it all over again, man. All right, all right. Did you personally have any emotional stress about the heavy responsibility? If so, how did you cope with it? I believe that I I really, I needed more help. They had so much faith in me. And one thing I will give them, they have a lot of, they had a lot of faith in me because I was juggling the job of five security guys. You know, I I had to micromanage a lot of people in, in the camp. I had to, don't do this. Wait, give me 15 minutes. Let me take care of him. Then I got him and then I'll take care of you. Then I'll do this and I'll do that. Nobody move until I say move and just wait. And then we'll get it, we'll circumvent it and we'll make it happen. Everybody can't do that. Every head of security can't do that. Because you get some guys in security that wants to be, they want to be the artist, or they want to be the limelight, mm. or they want to be the star, they want to be the celebrity, they want to get all the ass. They want to, you know. That wasn't my thing, man. That that was absolutely my thing. I was there, I was there to serve Eminem and inter, well, Shady Records. You know, um, so yeah, man, I was there to serve him, man. Bodyguard, being a bodyguard or anybody that's working with an artist, you're a servant. Whether you realize it or not, you're there to serve. Mm. Yeah, I mean, pretty much. You're just yeah, take, protecting their life and yes. making sure they that's are, what it are is, okay. Man. People can try to make it out to be whatever they want it to be, man, on TRL and hip hop and uh, whatever the other shows is, man, you know. My greatest life, you know, blinged out. Hey, man, you a servant. You're there to protect that person's life, or you're there to protect that person's money, or you're there to protect that person's legal issues. You're there to serve. A lot of times people get in these jobs and they forget that they are there to serve. That's the most, that is the highest form of humility, is to serve somebody else. Right, right. Yeah. Did you ever think during your time as being his bodyguard of throwing in the towel and quitting? Of quitting? Oh, yeah. Several times. Several times. Um, I, 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 needed, I needed more family time. Hmm. When the job took on more of being with him versus being with my family. Um, and then we started doing two shows a day. And I wanted more money. I had to actually go in and negotiate more money from the legal team. Like, look, man, we're doing two shows a day. We can't still get paid this regular money. And we're doing two shows a day. He's making more money. We should be making more money. So everybody needs to get more money. So I was kind of like the union, the union rep on that. Um, I got kind of burnt out because I'm like, okay, when you're on the road and, and whether you're the DJ, sound man, bodyguard, whatever, there's a such thing called the um, after eight weeks, everybody hates each other. Mm. 
Eight weeks, man, we could be the best of buds. On the eighth week, I hate your fucking guts. Because I'm looking at all these dudes, fucking hard legs. I want to be with my girl. I want to be with my wife or whatever. You want to be with your kids. You get tired of looking at these guys. You want to be able to, you want to be able to make a break for at least two weeks and then come back and do the same thing again. You understand what I'm saying? Um, so yeah, there were some times that I wanted to quit. You know, for when I wasn't being reverse funds or, um, you know, extremely long tours, uh, where I wasn't being respected as far as the money that I wanted or a contract. And there was a time I wanted to do a contract with these guys that would require them to do a contract to give me more money. And also, I wanted to implement a gag order on myself so I wouldn't be able to do shit like this, interviews. Hey, look, if, we, if you pay me this and we do a contract, I won't write any books, I won't do any movies, I won't do any documentaries, no interviews, none of that shit. So, ah, no, nah, we don't want to do that. We just want to pay you. I said, man, you sure? No, nah, we don't want to do that. I said, okay. But back then, I wasn't thinking about this. this. All this right here, what we're doing right now, this was never my intention, man. My intention was to get on with him, help him out, get my label a deal, get my artist signed, and move on. That was my intention. Okay. This was never part of the deal. Did his lifestyle on the road conflict with your integrity, core beliefs, religious beliefs in any way? Well, I will say this. <laughs> when I went on the road with him, I actually... Um, I've always been a believer in God, man. Always, no matter what. Um, so I always, you know, I had a Bible with me at all times. I had a Bible in my in my in my bunk on the tour bus, and I would read several passages a night. And there was a time where, believe it or not, I had Eminem reading the Bible. I sure did. Eminem doesn't seem like the Bible type. You know what? Eminem's very in touch with God. But he has come from a... Or at least not at that time. Not at that time. But he was open. Yeah. He was a sponge. At that time, he was open to everything. Open to everything that made sense. Oh, okay. So I, I, had him, I had him reading the Bible. We weren't doing like Bible class, no shit like that. But it was like, uh, he would read. He would read. I said, hey, man. I listen to you every night, man. Why don't you read this? Read this right here, man. I would just spring stuff. Hey, man, read this. Like a, you know, a chapter here. Not a chapter, but like a verse here. Mostly from Psalms. Oh, okay. Say, hey, man, read that. What do you think about it? I don't. Matter of fact, I had him reading the Bible one day. I will never forget this. Somebody came out with a t-shirt. You know he had a McDonald's shirt? No. Yeah. Eminem had on a McSatan shirt. And that, <laughs> I had him reading the Bible why he had on that Mick Satan shirt. Yeah. I mean, my thing was, man, it wasn't about religion. It was to make him think. I made him think. Nobody else in the camp made him think. Even to this day, I make him think. Hmm. I challenge his intellect like I'm doing right now. I challenge your intellect. You know I do. Give your boy a call. Stop playing, man. How did you traveling on tour, guarding his life, affect your life, and your family, and everything you had going on? Me protecting my family switched from me protecting him. Um, there was something that was said by my oldest son to his mother, my wife at the time. She says, uh, you know, your son asked me, if daddy's out protecting Eminem, who's going to protect us? Mm. Woo! That shit right there, man. Did something to me. That right there was the beginning of the spiral of me coming home. That phrase by my son. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
I hadn't thought about that in 20 years, man. Mm. Cam, you know some Bob Walter shit, man. That's pretty <laughs> good. You know who Bob Walter is, right? Yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> behind, behind the spotlight, what type of personality did Marshall Mathers have? He was a great guy, man. Em was a great guy. During the time that I worked with him, M was battling his personal identity as a father, his identity with fans, his identity with the industry, his identities with as a writer. So I could be talking to him, say if you're M and I'm, I'm me, it's just you and I in the room. At that time, I'm talking to Marshall. A fan walk in the room, now he's Eminem. Mm. And I have to know as the third person to switch to this is Eminem now. He has a fan, as a fan has entered the room, you have to acknowledge him as Eminem. The fan leaves, we're in the studio, now he's Slim Shady. Slim Shady is the writer. You have to address him as that in order to keep him to character. Now, Kim calls, he automatically goes to Marshall, which is the arguing, the beefing, the standing together, and all this other shit. Or when we arrive to Detroit before we're on a flight and the wheels get ready to touch down, Marshall, I would clearly say out to him, Marshall, what are you and your daughter doing this weekend? I will have to, I will have to summon mm. his government name to pull it out of him. As the wheels are touching down, you're not on the road anymore. You're not Eminem. You're not Slim Shady. We're back home. Marshall, what are you doing for your family this weekend? He said, and he would look at me like, I see what you're doing, man. I said, exactly. I know what I'm doing. The fans, the fan base is done. And even with that, I had to play the heavy on a lot of stuff. So like walking through the airport, I would have him sign a lot of uh, eight by 10 glossies, which you rarely see anymore because everybody got pictures and phones and all this shit. Sign a hundred of these, man. Give them to me. We walking through the airport. Oh my God, Eminem, you're my biggest fan. Can I get an autograph? Bam. Keep walking. Can you personalize it? No. Keep walking. Mm. So the whole time, from the car, we walk it. Every so often, he would want to stop and take a photo. Man, she just want to take a photo. Can I get a photo with her? So if you take one photo, which turns to two, which turns to three, which turns to five, which turns to 20, and he would not leave until he signed or take a picture with every one of those fucking people. Hmm. So all of these signed autographs I have over here is really null and void because you're still going to personalize it anyway. So he was always in touch, which made me realize, okay, even though he's up here, he's still a humble cat. So, yeah. It's a good dude, man. He, he's overall, he, overall, he could be an asshole. I'm going to twist it. He could be an asshole. But overall, he was a good dude, man. Did you like the man you personally bodyguarded? I did. Never a dull moment. Never a dull moment. Never a dull moment. You had to always be on your P's and Q's with this cat, man. You know what you was going to get, man. I remember we were in Germany. This didn't make the book. I was taking a shit. M got his little lady friend. Nas, I want to go get something to eat. Okay, dude, I need you to give me five minutes. I'm in the bathroom. Give me five minutes. I need you to go now. I said, hey, my stomach don't work off of your, uh, your readiness, man, to, to go. I said, just give me five minutes. He fucking left the hotel while I was on John. Hmm. So I had to learn how to shit quicker. <laughs> That's the sad part, man. So, of course, I had to go through my business, got out, ran out 
had to find him on the street already in the streets of Germany, man. I think we were in Cologne, Cologne, Germany. I said, dude, what the fuck, man? I told you that. He said, hey, man, I was ready to go now. I said, that's not how the shit work, man. He said, I'm going to need you shit quicker. Those are his exact words. Mm. <laughs> Did you ever That see- was the asshole part. Mm. Yeah. All right, right. Did you ever state in any of your prior interviews that Suge Knight put a hit, on, hit or attempted to kill him? Man, you know what? I don't really know what the intention was, but they weren't great. You know, it was never vocalized to me that we're trying to kill him. The one thing that I always said, uh, and, and you go back and you read my book, man, 20 years ago, they were trying to force him over to sign with Death Row Records. That was their intentions, but they were so aggressive with it. Uh, one of the things that I do want to state, and I want to say this right here, right now, and I'm saying this on California turf right now. When Suge was up for sentencing, I did an interview with uh, Murder Music, good friends of mine. These guys are pretty good. They did a real great interview. But the media decided to take a snippet and change the headlines that says, uh, Suge Knight put a hit on Eminem. I never said that. That was their perspective of saying that. And they only said that because Suge was up on a murder trial, murder trial for running somebody over the video shoot. They were trying to use that as, trying to use me as an involuntary character witness. I, since I said this in the book, or I said this in the interview, and that's not what I said. They took and twisted my words. You can go back and look at all my stuff. I've never said anything about that. I've always stuck to the guns about, hey, look, they were trying to force him over to death row. And they did pursue us. They did strong arm us. But I never said anything about them guys trying to kill us. They was on our ass. But I never used those words to kill. Suge said to kill anybody. The media, just like they did in the East Coast, West Coast beef, the Puffet killings, I mean not Puffet killings, excuse me, the Biggie killing, the Tupac killing, the media took it and twisted it to build headlines. And that's the one thing I can honestly say. I didn't like what they did to try to use my words in an interview to build their own headline. And I'm a communication and mass media major. I went to school for this shit. So I know what they were doing. They're trying to make him guilty in the Court of Appeals. You don't need to make him guilty in the Court of Appeals. You've seen a man run a guy over on TMZ. What do you need me for? You understand what I'm saying? So don't don't do that. That's that's one of the biggest regrets that I have about the book, about the interviews, that they tried to use me, use a black man against another black man that has nothing to do with him because we had history and passing. You understand what I'm saying? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Were there any personal hits out on Eminem's life? Not that I know of. Okay. But as a bodyguard, you have to treat it like the whole world. You have, as a bodyguard, when you get hired as a bodyguard, you have to treat the whole world as if it's a hit out on them or else they would not hire personal security. So you don't have to have a hit out on somebody in order to treat it like a hit. You go into protection mode to make sure that your client arrives alive every day. Was there any time that you felt threatened from the fans or from people? Did you ever get any death threats from writing the book? I got a lot of hate mail. I got a lot of hate mail. When I say hate mail, I mean like, I say hate email. Uh, Not just from them, but also from the media. There was a guy, I don't remember his name, but uh, what a lot of people don't know, Shady Business is the first book ever published on him. And the only book to this day from an insider standpoint. So that's history. Not once, but twice. There was a couple of um, journalists that called me. and said, head, uh, um, Byron, who gave you the fucking right to write a book on Eminem? You don't know anything. I said, what are you talking about? I said, man, I work with the guy. 
I said, you know, I, I think I know more than you do. And they told me, see, you know, we're going to do everything we can to steal your fucking book, to steal your, to steal your idea, to steal, excuse me, to steal your, your book, to make sure it's copyrighted and all of that stuff. I had people call me and tell me, hey, look, we read the book. It's a great fucking book. We hate that you wrote it. Of course, these weren't black people. They were white people telling me this shit. I'm like, why the fuck y'all calling and telling me this shit? He said, we're going to steal a book. You better make sure that shit is protected. You have no wow. fucking right to write that book on him, man. Eminem is a god. See, yeah, so what they got to do with me? You're not supposed to write that fucking book on him. We're going to check it out and we're going to call you back. People that want to do movies call me. Uh, I mean, I had a lot of threats, man. A lot of threats. A lot of business financial threats. I had more financial threats than I did hate, hate threats. Wow. Um, the one, the one thing that, that strikes me the most, that I remember the most, I would say was 2000, 2001. I went to a book fair. Shady Business was doing very well. I was making a lot of money then. And I went to a book fair in Chicago. And I was there to meet um, several CEOs of some publishing companies. And this guy picked me out of a crowd. He said, hey. I'm walking through, I got my suit on, and he said, hey man, you're Byron Williams. I said, yeah, how you know me? He said, man, come here, man. I'm with so-and-so publishing. He said, man, I gotta tell you. He said, the industry loves your fucking book. The publishing industry, we love your fucking book. He said, but here's the thing. Nobody's gonna get in bed with you. I said, why not? He said, because we're trying to get in bed with Eminem. He's got to die one day. And when he do, we're going to make a lot of money off that shit. So this guy's telling me this shit. Mm. And I'm like, I can't believe this fucking guy's telling me this shit. He said, if I were you. This is what he told me. He said, if I were you, I'd hire a hitman and kill him. What? So you can make all the money. I said, whoa, man. <clears throat> I, said, I, I said, whoa, man. It's not that serious. I said, we had a little falling out, but I, ain't, I don't want to see the man dead. I said, it's not like that. I said, I don't wish no ill on him. He said, I'm just saying, man. He said, but I'm going to tell you this. He said, whatever you do, never sell your rights to your book. He said, because the day that he dies, he said, you're going to be a fucking millionaire overnight. So as this guy's telling me this, this is the CEO. I'm not going to mention the name of the publishing company he was with. There's an there's a author that coming in, a big-time author coming in. I wish I could remember who it was. Big-time author coming in with security, paparazzi. So I'm talking to this guy, and you see all these flashes, paparazzi, security, people, the crowd is moving. He said, hey, I got to go now. I got to talk to my client. So he turns from me. He turns from me right into a pose with his client with a picture. If you go, I guarantee you, man, there's a picture with me in the background looking like, the fuck? In the back of their picture mm. while he's taking a picture with them. And I'm like, wow. So this guy suggested you should kill him. I would never do that, man. No, no, of course, of yeah, course. I, I just, would never do that. That's a... That's... He was saying that he was being sarcastic. He was being funny, but oh, okay, but okay. the reality of it is the reality. But it was of like it, it was like if he died, yeah, wink, if he wink. Died, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but the reality of it is not just Eminem. Any musician, w would you? Any have, musician. Let would, me let me say this real quick. Any musician in hip hop, R and B, gospel, rock and roll, whatever, when they die. That is the most amount of money that a label is going to make off of them. Because for some reason, the psyche and fans and the public is, oh, buy up all the stuff. Buy up all the memorabilia. Right, uh, right. Next yeah. week, they're going to print the same shit. But is they want to be the first to buy up all the limited editions or the classics or this or the live recordings because of course they will do only so many of those so i'm sorry go ahead no no that's all good um 
Would it give, I mean, if he passed away, would it give you more rights to do things with what you have that you couldn't do now? Here's the thing, Or do you man. think you would just get more offers? Here's the thing. I don't live my life based off the back of Eminem Ahar's work, man. I'm a hardworking guy. You know, when, when M got his deal, I had, I had three cars. I had a house, furniture. He was staying with his, with his, his baby mama. And he had sold, at that point in time, platinum records. So, it, you know, it, it, to me, it's never about that. One of the things, I'm going to say this, man. This, I'm, I'm burying this book. Today, this is the last of the last of the interviews, man. I'm done with this shit, man. It's been a love-hate relationship between me and this book. Uh, this fucking book almost took me out of here, man. It almost took me out of here. Stress, high blood pressure, all that shit, man. Just, But at the same time, it's been very lucrative to me. It's been very lucrative to me. I didn't make as much money as I wanted to make. Uh, but I made some good money. I took a lot of exotic trips. I bought a lot of shit. I paid off a lot of stuff. Uh, but I never want to see profits off another man's demise. That's not who I am. And, and truth be told, truth be told, man, I've carried this man's torch for the last 20 years. I helped him to stay relevant. You know, I'm done with that. I got bigger and better things coming down the pipe that I want to do with my life. And... Um, it's time to move forward. It's a 20-year anniversary. That's why I gave Cam Capone the opportunity to, you know, to shoot this and, and move forward. I'm done with it, man. I'm done with it. Life goes on. If you stay stagnant in a place too long, man, you won't have any growth. It's time for me to grow, you know? And I appreciate the opportunity, Cam. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I appreciate it too, man. Appreciate your time, definitely. Most definitely. Did you consider yourself a close friend of Eminem? We weren't at first. It was all business at first. I, I would say um, maybe a third of the way through the, the tour, the first tour, we got, we got close. Um, as we got close like brothers. Oh, okay. Um, there, there was times, man, you know, he would console. A lot of people don't know this, man. I'm going to put it all on the line now. I'm giving you some exclusive shit right here, man. Um, when Eminem had problems at his house, he said, hey, man, come get me, man. Shit's crazy over here. I go and scoop him. I pick him up, bring him to my house. He sleep on my couch. Mm -hmm. Just to downplay the beef between him and Kim. One night he called me, hey, man, these motherfuckers jumped me at the bus stop in Detroit. First of all, what you doing at the fucking bus stop in Detroit? Man, I was mad. I was trying to take a walk. Come get me. I remember getting out the seat at the movie theater with my wife then. Babe, we gotta go. You just got back from the road. We gotta go now. I gotta pick this guy up. I take her, pick, I take her, drop her off, pick him up, talk with him, find out what's going on, bring him back to the house. He sleep on the couch, play video games with my son, my oldest boy at that time. Mm -hmm. Who's a rapper, by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. He still remembers all of that, man. He was four years old at the time. Oh, man. Yeah. That must, he must have liked that. Yeah, yeah. Did Eminem have any, uh, did Eminem have any hang-ups that you had to, con that you had to confront him about? And if there was, can you explain them? Or how you handled them? Let's see. <laughs> Eminem wasn't a hang-up type of guy. He did, he did whatever he wanted. He, he did whatever he wanted to do. He didn't have a lot of hang-ups. I'm sitting here thinking, I don't, I don't recall any hang-ups. Uh, he lived in the moment, man. Whatever he wanted to do, he did it. Yeah. And if you did something that was out more outlandish, out more outlandish than he did, he got a kick out of it. So, no, nah, I can't say. At that time, in 1999, he didn't have any hang-ups that I knew about. Were the people and or record labels that represented Eminem have his best interests at heart when it came to contracts, negotiations, and everything? Yeah, because they have a lot to gain and a lot to lose. I want to say something here, man, and I'm going to be real. 
you're not going to get this from a lot of people. And I hate to make everything racial. I've been in the game a long time. I've done music. I've, done, I've been a writer. I've been a producer. You have two sets of contracts in the music industry. Let's just be real. A lot of people are not going to talk about this shit. During that time, when M signed, that's when the industry was pretty still honest. God, I don't want to say this, but it, it, it got to be said, man. This is fucked up, Cam, but I'm going to say it. Listen, there's black contracts and there's white contracts. It is what it is, man. And you can you can ask people, and when I say ask people, you gotta ask. If you, even if you go all the way back to like Sam Cooke and James Brown, Little Richard, and then you go back to Danny Kay, you go back to Elvis. Here's the thing, man. White artists die rich, and they make multi million dollars. Their estates continue to make multi-million dollars. And their families continue to make multi-million dollars while they're dead. I think, is, is Elvis still the, the leading? Does he make $80 million a year while he's dead? He didn't make that kind of money when he was alive. Yeah. But then you get guys like James Brown, maybe 15, 20 million. Um, this is really not a lot of money over there, man. People don't talk about that shit. It's a whole nother element of the game. You got black contracts and you got white contracts. The blacks are going to always be the worker bees. And then the whites going to always be the profiteers, man. It's just what it is. It's not being racist. It's not being racial. It's just, it is what it is. It is what it is. And, and part of that too, you know, and I'm going to say this, part of that too is that some of the blacks at that time didn't take care of their legal business. You see what I'm saying? You, you, got, you got to get your copyrights. You got you to own your publishing. You got to do this. You got to do that. And some of them did that. Some of them did that. But then whoever, the upper echelon that was in control of that, once you're dead, you don't have no control over shit. Am I right? You're dead. Well, you're yeah, dead. Of course. So, that being said, it is what it is, man. What was your relationship like on tour with Proof, DJ Head, Gus, and Billy, and the, and the road manager? I love that crew, man. They're my, you know what? Those are my top five favorite guys of all time, man. I love those dudes, man, because Gus, although Gus was younger than us, Gus at the time was 28 but he had been on tour with the Foo Fighters since he was 15. So he had 13 years on the road. You know, um, then you had, you had the sound man, you know, you had Billy the sound man. Those guys, man, they, they were an eclectic group of realists. And most of them from out here, out here in Cali. Good dudes, man. I would love to have a reunion with them cats, man. I love them guys, man. They were really, them guys really changed and formatted my life, and they don't even realize it, man. Even Eminem, had it not been for Eminem and Paul Rosenberg, I'm gonna give Paul, I'm gonna shout out to Paul. This ain't no ass kissing, nothing like that, man. I've been a writer for a long time. I've been a writer since I was 15. But since I've worked with those guys, I've been able to write the first book, Shady Business, and I have written. Four other books since then. I got one more book coming. So since working with them, those guys have sparked six books out of me just by working with Eminem. Because if I had not been working with Eminem, I maybe had never wrote a book or maybe it happened later. But they sparked six books out of me. So I pay homage to Eminem and Paul Rosenberg. Um for the trial and tribulation, because, uh, you know, pressure creates diamonds. We went through a cold spell and it created a diamond, man. And out of that, you know, it, it helped me. It didn't make me, but it helped me 
to be able to focus on my craft, what I was doing, to get out of that limelight of Eminem. And that's why I'm here today with you, Cam, to, to put the bed to rest, man. I'm not carrying that torch no more, man. Done. Right. Done. If you had an opportunity to say something to Eminem right now, what would it be? Hey, man. Let's go get a vegetarian Whopper, man. At the airport, just like you did when you missed your flight to go to New York for the photo shoot. Let's sit down and chop it up, man. We old now. Look at all this fucking gray in the beard, man. We old, dog. Your daughter and my son is the same age. 23, 24 years old. I'm over it, man. I hope you over it. Don't let your handlers say that you're not over it. Be your own man. Like you are. You're a boss, man. I'm a boss. You know how to get at me. You know how to get at me, man. I reached out to Cutler and Settlemeyer. I reached out to Paul Rosenberg several times over the years. Not just for money purposes, man, in regards to trying to build a business venture, but hey man, I want my little brother back. Because one or the other, man, either we gonna see each other in person or we're gonna be standing over the other person coughing. Either way, it's gonna be closure. Why don't we both do it while we standing up, man? It's just real. Now, that being said, let's make some money in the mix, man. Stop bullshitting. You never have enough money. You know, you're sitting at almost a billion over there. It's okay, man. It's okay. You're supposed to get billions. You're getting money. But hey, let's do this movie. This only covers 1999. You cover the other 19 years. Let's slide this 1999 in with the rest. I already got a billionaire investor, man, that's done several big-time movies that have won Oscars. He's just waiting on me to get you to say yes. Do it, not do it. I don't care, man. I don't give a shit because I got other stuff that's going on. But damn, if we could do it, it'd be the biggest fucking movie and box office of all time, man. Let's leave Haley and your other two daughters and my oldest son, Byron, and Brandon and Bryce and their kids set for life, man. Get up off your high horse, man. Holler at your boy, man. We all right. I'm not mad at you, man. I'm done. I'm over it. Let's get this motherfucking money, dog. Call me, man. We can seal this deal tomorrow. This ain't no talk. I did this shit on my own. I got these people ready to shoot tomorrow. Holler me, M. Or should I say, Marshall? Should we expect to hear or see any more from Byron Big Naz Williams in the future? Man, I always got some stuff in the works, man. That's one of the reasons why I'm putting this down. I can't carry this torch no more as Big Nas. As a matter of fact, after today, the name Big Nas is done with Shady Business because that is, uh, that goes along with this. I'm done, man. I'm done. All right. I'm done. Ain't no, ain't no hate. I wish that guy the best. I wish his daughter the best. I wish my son the best. And all that they do. We getting old now, man. Let's not do this shit in the fucking nursing home. We're in our 40s still. I'm 49. You about to be 47, 48 in September. Let's get this fucking money. You already got money. Let's get more money. Don't you want to see your shit on the big screen before you die? Be in control of your, of your destiny right now, man. We can be the first duo to go see the biopic where we sit in the front row together at the Resolve Beef. 
Even Dre and Easy E couldn't even do that, man. But we can. Let's make it happen, man. All right. Still love you, bro. Shady business. I'm out. Done promoting it. That's it. <laughs>